another webinar by Wild Poland, which is the Polish affiliate of the World Institute for Action Learning. My name is Tom, and I will lead this webinar for you. Let me know down in the chat box um, if you can hear me, if you can see me well. I had some trouble launching this webinar for some reason, but I noticed you guys started your conversation. So just let me know if you can hear me, if you can see me. As you have noticed, uh, this webinar will be in English. It's the first international webinar in quite some time that I'm leading because I'm based in Poland, as I, as I can see most of the people that are here, but I can see some people from England and from other countries as well. So it's great that you guys all are here. Okay, you guys can see me and hear me. Excellent, excellent. So as you know, probably we talk today we're talking about action learning and developing high performing teams now there's one thing i have to tell you i have bad news i let some of you guys know uh in the email blast i think i sent yesterday yesterday in the morning that Chuck appleby from the usa would join me and present one of the tools he uses in his action learning sessions but last night he emailed me and he said he has some family issues that he has to address. So he will not be joining me tonight. Unfortunately, he's open to uh, doing another webinar um, in quite some time. But tonight he unfortunately will not join us. Sorry about that. So I will be presenting you with my tools that I personally use in my team coaching sessions. Okay, let me turn on the presentation and tell you what will happen? Um, hold on one second. Okay, this is the presentation that we will use. And we have time until 10 p.m., my time, Polish time. So, so it's about an hour, roughly 60 minutes. I will try not to keep you longer here. And this is the agenda for tonight. So first, I will tell you what action learning is in a nutshell. Because as usual, we have some people here who are experts in action learning, and I can see my action learning coaches that I trained in the school of action learning that I run in Poland. I can see you guys here, but I know we have some people here who are not experts in action learning and maybe don't know much about action learning yet. We always have people like that in the webinar, so I will very quickly tell you what action learning is so that we all understand the context of the entire webinar. And then I will give you three models of teamwork, so to speak. Three models that present what um, high-performing teams are characteristic of. And these are the models that you can use in your team coaching sessions, in your workshops, in your facilitation. They're pretty useful. So I'm basically giving you these models. Uh, I will be telling about them in a very sort of um, um, not superficial, but I will not be going to details because I will tell you where you can find them. So you can Google them and read in details about them. But I will tell you about them so you can understand um, the context of, of, the la of the tools that I will be talking about later on. And then I will tell you about how action learning coaches work to develop high-performing teams and what tools I specifically use in my team coaching sessions to make my teams work more effectively, more smoothly, and in a more just pleasant way with more satisfaction. And then at the end, hopefully, we'll have some time for the Q&A session. Now, if you have some questions on the way, make sure you save them for the end. So just note them down. Make sure you have a pen and paper right beside you because it's a lot easier for me to just give you the content tell you what I have to tell you, and then answer your questions. I'm like a typical man. I can do one thing well at a time. So I will focus on giving you the content, and then, then I will re reply with some questions um, with, uh, to your questions. Um, there was one more thing I wanted to say. What was I going to say? All right, I forgot. Anyway, if it comes to my mind, I'll just tell you. Okay. All right. Um, if you have any technical problems, let me know down in the chat box. All right. Sometimes it happens. So if you if you experience any problems, you can use another browser. If you stop seeing me or anything like that, let me know. Maybe there will be a problem on my side. I will try to deal with that too. It happens sometimes as well. Okay. Let's do it. 
So number one, what is action learning? So when people ask me what action learning is, I usually tell them action learning is a process. It's an intensive process in which a small group, five, six, seven people of as diverse backgrounds and competencies as possible, is working on a complex and urgent and important challenge, a problem. Now, what is important in this work is that they focus on questions, questions that will seek the core of the problem, the roots of the problem, that will trigger their creativity and will foster smooth, effective communication. Now, this team takes real actions and learns from those actions. Now, learning in action learning, I understand very concretely. I understand action learning or learning in action learning as increasing the quality of work. That's basically what action learning is all about and what learning is all about. Re you know, the general reflection and finding out truth about yourself, about other people, about reality, the nature of the challenge. It's very, very useful and it's very important. But in the end, we try to nail down the, 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 those reflections and conclusions to our everyday work and think about how we can work more effectively, more smoothly, in a quicker way, with more satisfaction, on the basis of what we have learned. So basically, learning is increasing the quality, the effectiveness, and satisfaction from work. That's what action learning is all about. So in a nutshell, you could say it's a process for designing solutions to important problems, and at the same time, it's a process that allows people to become better and better at what they do as leaders, managers, or team members. Now, what is important for me is that action learning is very, very compatible with some research and very practical observations as far as teamwork is concerned. So now I will give you three models that I personally always keep in mind when I look, when I work with my teams. And I try to search for these characteristics to make sure they are working as effectively as possible. So the research number one I wanted to tell you about is the research from Google. Some time ago, Google conducted their project Aristotle. And if you go to Google, I mean, the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the browser or the search engine, and if you go, if you type in Google research teams, project Aristotle, Aristotle, like the philosopher, you will find details. But in a nutshell, Google figured out that there are five basic, like most important characteristics of high-performing teams. And like number one is the most important one. There is a large gap between the rest of them. But basically these five that you can see right here on the slide, they are the foundation of uh, high-performing teams in Google. Psychological safety means that I, as a team member, I know, I have this belief that if I make a mistake, it's not going to be held against me, but it will be an opportunity for learning. Now, dependability means that I, as a team member, I know that when my colleagues say that they will do something, they will do it. They will deliver what they are supposed supposed to deliver. And I can count on them. I can depend on the rest of my team. Structure and clarity means I know the roles. I know who does what, why. I know when I should go to which person, in which situations. Should I use whose expertise? Four, meaning means that what I do is personally important for me. Like it really counts for me that I do this the best I can. And number five means that we as a team, we have this shared belief that what we do has larger impact. It really influences the reality around us and our work is not in vain. Now you could say in business organizations, it's pretty obvious, right? Everybody's work should be not in vain, should be impactful and meaningful, but it's not always the case, unfortunately. And I personally know teams who do not share all of these characteristics. But what I can do is help them create their environment uh, the, in the best possible way, uh, keeping in mind what they can influence and what they can't influence so that these characteristics are there to the 
you know, to the highest possible extent. Now, model number two I want to tell you about is also based on research because Google research, you could really look at this as at scientific research. Google, I think, really does good work as far as like science is concerned and math and everything. And similarly, MIT does uh, their research. MIT is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the best technical university in the United States, maybe in the world, who knows. If you want to be a rocket scientist, you go to MIT. And some time ago, they conducted their own research. And for some reason, they, always developed they also developed five characteristics of high-performing teams. So they are more descriptive than those from Google. Let's take a look at them. Number one is that everyone, every on the team, oh, sorry, everyone on the team talks and listens roughly in roughly equal measure, keeping contributions short and sweet. There is roughly equal amount of participation from everyone. And if you look at the research, what's interesting, if you look at the research from Google, if you go in depth into that research, you'll find out that this is one of the behaviors that contribute to psychological safety. This is one of those behaviors that everybody speaks roughly in, uh, in, in, in a similar amount of time. There's, there's balance in participation. For some reason, that is present in all teams that share psychological safety. Number two, members face one another and their conversations um, and gestures are energ energetic. They face one another. They sit in a way that they can see each other. It's very interesting when I start team coaching sessions, when I start action learning sessions, even if, even, even in really like mature, well-performing teams, it happens that people, when they start the meeting, they sit in a way that they cannot see each other, at least partially. Like one person cannot really see the other person because she is sitting right beside the other one and cannot you know, see the face expressions or the gestures or the behavior of that person sitting right beside. So I always ask my teams, make sure, or, or yeah, I always say, make sure you're sitting in a way that you, everybody can see everyone else. And they always change positions, even slightly, even like a few centimeters. But they noticed that initially when they sat down, they were sitting in a way that some of them could not see someone else. Number three, members connect directly with one another, not just with the team leader. People talk to each other in different directions. They don't talk to one person only. Now, number four, members carry on back channel or side conversations within the team. This means that when one person is talking, like the leader, or maybe another person is saying something, two people maybe having a short conversation, one, two, three sentence conversation, and they're whispering uh, on the side. Now, this is counterintuitive, right? Like we were always taught that one person is speaking and everybody else is listening, right? That this is the this is what the effective communication looks like. And there we go. Surprise, surprise. Looks like the high performing teams uh, that that MIT examined really share this this behavior. So this probably means that people, when they have something to ask about, or when they have a remark to to give but not necessarily like to everyone in the team, but to one person. They, they use that channel, you know, this, this back channel of, of the conversation to ask a question or give the remark, and they don't use the space in the, you know, entire team. And number five, members periodically break, go exploring outside the team and bring information back. Also, if you look at the research from Google on managers, that was called Project Oxygen. Very interesting. Go Google Project Oxygen. And they developed 10, I think, 10 behaviors of a successful, like, good manager in Google. One of those behaviors that those managers share is that they work across the organization, which means they 
they they work outside of their of their sort of uh, immediate uh, working zone, and they reach out to other professionals from other parts of the organizations. They work across the organization, so they they reach out even uh, to the other side of the organization, so to speak. And this is very similar. This means that the team <coughs> is not working only or maybe is not using only the resources that it has within, but it goes beyond its boundaries and is looking for resources, support, whatever outside of their team department, part of the organization, uh, plant, whatever that might be. Okay, and model number three, what do you think number, model number three can be? I think you can have a good guess. If you th think about it, let me know down in the chat box. What do you think number model number three can be that I would like to present you with? Maybe you know some models of teamwork. Maybe you know some models that I don't know and other people don't know. Maybe we can share some information and exchange it. Let me know down in the chat box uh, from KP. I don't know that one, Marcin, if that's a model for teamwork. But if you have a, a guess of what model number three can be, let me know down in the chat box. What do you think? Okay, I can see some people are typing. So I'll give them a minute. Lencioni, Grzyna says, okay, that's a popular model. Lencioni's dysfunctions, any other guesses? Not really, okay. Well, let's take a look. Yes, it is Lenciani. Patrick Lenciani some time ago developed this model of team dysfunctions. And for some reason, he has five uh, characteristics of low-performing teams. Um, but we can obviously change them into high-performing teams. Congratulations, Grzyna. Um, this is not based on research. This is just Lenciani's guess. <laughs> this is just his observations, his experience. And it's kind of obvious, yet it makes sense. But please remember, all these models are just models. They, they do not constitute for the 100% of the reality. The life is always richer than any model, any theory. And like in Lanciani's case, there has been some criticism over his model. So I try not to stick to any particular model, but I try to look at different ones to sort of you know, combine um, my view on the reality of high-performing teams, so to speak. So Lenciani helps, definitely. It's a useful model. And he says that absence of trust is number one dysfunction. And an absence of trust in his understanding is exactly the same as psychological safety in Google. It's exactly the same. He actually differentiates be between trust and like, and like vulner vulnerability based trust so if you if you go read lanciani you will notice that he not, i don't think he names it psychological safety but he describes it in exact same terms as people from google so fear of conflict would be number two and of course it means like subject conflict like content conflict not interpersonal conflict but but the but the dysfunction would be that people don't discuss they don't like argue over some things, but they but they agree to some proposals uh, too soon, and then the solutions are too weak. Um, number three would be lack of commitment. Like, sorry, it should be lack of commitment, not lack commitment. Although that could be verb as uh, a verb as well. Teams lack commitment. That's a dysfunction. So Lencioni will say that 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 poor teams. Don't do what they will say they what they say they will do, right? So the commitment here would be really taking actions and making sure things are delivered, uh, and what we planned is there in a week, two weeks, or two months. Now, number four would be avoidance of accountability, which means that people do not really pay attention to to other people in the team. That we as a team do not do not pay attention to what we deliver and. And, and, and if other people are delivering as well what they are supposed to deliver, um, that would be the accountability, sort of team accountability, making sure other people 
do their work as well. And then in attention to results, <coughs> which means, as Lanciani says, people sometimes fail to monitor the progress. And then in the end, they don't know where they are. They don't know how much time they devoted to some things and what the effects were and how much time they need to finish them off and when they will achieve what they want to achieve. So, and, and then the, the, he says also quite wise thing as I see it. He says, if you don't monitor results, if you don't care about results, people start caring about other things. And they start caring about themselves too much, like their role, their, um, you know, um, what they gain from 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 their work, how much they can, how much they can gain from different interpersonal games they enter in the organization, and so on and so forth. Okay, so so these are the three models of show what high performing or in Lanciani's case, low performing teams can look like. Now I have. I have some tools for you that I use in my action learning sessions that help me bring those teams more towards what these models show. Now, before I tell you about those five tools, I, I have some, some initial guidelines for you. If you want to use these tools and if you want to use action learning approach, even if you don't know action learning yet, you can try to use action learning approach, but you have to remember about some things. So I, I, I want to give you these five guidelines. They're not like typical action learning guidelines. They're my guidelines for you in this webinar. I wrote them specifically for you guys for tonight. Keeping in mind that you might want to use these tools in your sessions, workshops. Number one, have the team work on a real and complex challenge. If in, even if you're running a workshop on like communication, leadership skills, conflict resolution, things like that, you can devote part of that workshop to uh, a session in which small groups or teams, five, six, sorry, five, six, seven people, not more, are working on a, on a real challenge that one person presents. Of course, it has to be confidential, but let's imagine one person in that group says, okay, I'm a manager. I have this problem in my team or I have this, um, there is this change happening in my organization and circumstances are changing and I have this issue right now or I have this team and I'm, I'm facing a challenge with this team and it's about, right? So that person presents a real important complex challenge to the team that is supposed to help that person find a solution. Now, you want to make sure that they focus on questions in while action learning. If you know while that's the World Institute for Action Learning, and I lead while Poland, the Polish affiliate. But if you don't know while, make sure you go to while.org, which is wial.org, or wilepoland.org for that matter. So in while action learning, we have this ground rule, which is very specific to this variety of action learning. Because if you think about action learning, there are some varieties present in the world. But while action learning is a way of team coaching that has the specific rule for communication, which means every statement must be formed in response to a question. We don't use statements that are not in response to a question. Every statement, you can always form a statement, you can only form statements in response to a question. A question can be asked by by anyone, of anyone, at any time. Doesn't matter. The direction of communication doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what kind of a question it is. Open-ended, closed-ended. Of course, people are encouraged to ask open-ended questions. But we focus on questions a lot. And actually, I think every action learning variety focuses on questions, but in different ways. So if you want to try out this rule, you have to be careful because it's very powerful. And it changes communication dramatically in the team. You can give it a try, but make sure you do it. If you don't know action learning and you're not a professional action learning coach, make sure you do it with a team that is safe for you. You know them. You can handle whatever happens during that meeting. Um, and you can explain clearly to them why they're using this rule. But anyway, you can always focus on questions in two ways. Number one, you can ask questions of that team. 
And number two, you can encourage them to ask questions of each other, simply asking a question. You know, every now and again, when the meeting is going on, you can ask a question. What question can be posed right now? I'm hearing a lot of statements. I'm hearing a lot of exchanges of ideas, opinions, judgments sometimes. Now, let's think about a question. Let's write, let everyone write down one question that he or she would like to ask right now of the group or one specific person to move our work forwards. Or what is the question that anyone right now can, could ask to help us find the core of the problem, generate solutions, right? Things like that. Number three, do not lead the meeting. Action learning coaches, especially in the wild methodology, do not lead the meeting. The meeting is the group's meeting, but the role of the coach is to let them work and observe and intervene to foster learning, number four. Intervene whenever I see an opportunity for learning. So the session could begin, you know, you have this team, five, six, seven people, somebody presents a challenge, and you say, okay, well, who has the first question, for example? That's how we begin the session in while action learning. And you let the team work, and but you observe them very carefully to make sure that whenever there is something, whenever there is an obstacle, a problem in communication, a lot of statements, a lot of judgment, a lot of, you know, initial, uh, like, uh, possible solutions or ideas that are not in response to the core problem, but are just in response to the symptoms. Whenever these things happen, you intervene and you say, hold on, let's stop for a moment. Let's take a look at what we're doing, what we can learn from this part to move our work forwards in the next 20 minutes, 30, 40 minutes, well, you know, uh, whatever the duration of the meeting is. And then number five, which is very important, which you probably know, it's important in the trainer's work, facilitator's work, coach's work. Do not judge. Do not assess the, the work of the team. Let them work. Sometimes the group will be very high performing. Sometimes they will be low performing. But they always work as best as they can. They always work as, as best as they can. Even if they suck. Even if it's like it's a disaster. <laughs> they always do their best. Like that's, how, that's what people are like. But the, you know, the, the, the effects can differ. Let them work and help them learn. Help them draw conclusions from what they're doing and help them decide how they can work in a better way. That's the approach we take to working with groups, roughly speaking. And this is the framework. This is the sort of, sort of environment in which I use the tools that I will present you with right now. Tool number one. It's called SRWR, which means for Stop, Reflect, Write, Report. It's a very useful tool, very simple. Um, I started using this tool when I was trained uh, in the USA in action learning, and nobody told me I'm using this tool, and I, and I didn't know it until I read about it in Ernie Turner's book, Gentle Interventions in Team Coaching. And if you want to read a good book on team coaching, I recommend it. Ernie actually is not in, in, in a typical action learning world. He's more into action reflection learning variety. It's a really good book, and he describes the tool there. And it's a really simple tool that is supposed to help people, everybody in the team, reflect on what the team is doing to work better in a second. So it has four simple stages. Stop. Reflect, write, report. Stop means uh, we, we stop working. So the coach will say, or you as a trainer, when you're leading a workshop, and you can see there's something going on in the group. Like there is, you know, we're not, we're not working as effectively as we could or in this team coaching session or in this facilitation. You could say, you know, we've been working for about an hour right now. We've been working for like 15 minutes or half an hour. Let's, let's pause for a moment to take a look at the pulse of the group the pulse of our team, right? Now, I want everybody to think about answers to two questions. Question number one, name one thing we're doing well. Give me one thing we're doing well and write it down. In point. Think about one thing we could differently. 
to work more effectively. We, one thing we can do better, write it down. Don't tell me it. Don't tell me. Sometimes I don't use this tool. I just let people tell me. But when I want them to stop and reflect, I tell them, don't tell me. Write down. I will ask you in a second. Take 30 seconds to think and write. What does it do? Well, it does a couple of things. Number one, it gives everybody equal time to think and develop the answer. You have extroverts in your groups. They will speak up you know, instantly. You have introverts who will not speak up so quickly or they will not speak up at all. If you, if you stop people, have them think and write things down, everybody has equal chances. Number two, when you write down, you, you make your thoughts concrete, specific. You make your thoughts concise. You don't elaborate and talk too much when you're asked later on. And then when you stop and you think and you write, you have more time to think. You have more time to reflect and really like grasp the, the one most important thing. Sometimes when I ask people, what are we doing well? What can we do better? They tell me, but they, but, but they tell me like superficial stuff, stuff that is on the surface. When I, want to, when I want them to go deeper in the process, in what is going on in the group, I tell them, okay, let's do it again. Let's take 30 seconds and give me one thing that is most important for you in what we're doing here, that, is, that we're doing well. One thing you think we should change. And they tell me different stuff. Okay, and then report. Then I ask them, you tell me, you tell me. And then everybody tells me these two things. It's quick. It's efficient. Everybody participates. Everybody has equal chances. There's no taking too much space. Stop, reflect, write, report. I don't tell them what they should do. I don't assess it. I intervene. I say, let's pause. Let's reflect. You guys tell me. And when we finish, I say, okay, uh, you just told me what we can do better, right? I asked you, you told me. Now the responsibility for implementing these actions that we can do better is on you. Who has the next question? Who would like to move our work further? That's how I end my intervention. That's how action learning coaches work. Yeah, that's the, that's the, uh, that's the title of the book, exactly, that you guys, uh, that you guys uh, typed in the chat box. Thanks for help. Okay, uh, tool, number, tool number two, the brief. Tool number two is the brief. Uh, something that every trainer will probably do at the end of an exercise, right? We talk about what happened. We draw conclusions from what we did, how we did on that. However, in action learning, this is the, one of the crucial parts. And in action learning, we make it a bit longer. We make it a bit more specific, a bit more detailed, okay? So at the end of every meeting, I will devote at least 15 minutes. This is like the minimum time. And it doesn't matter what kind of meeting it is. Team coaching, facilitation, regular business meeting. I don't lead regular business meetings. But when I'm like observing regular business meeting and then people want me to like help out with um, their learning, I will tell them save at least 15 minutes. Maybe 20 if it's a longer meeting. Maybe 25 if we really want to focus on that to talk about how the meeting went. All right. And I could ask some of these questions, all of these questions and more. What shall we do after this meeting? What is the, what is the, what is the plan after this meeting? In action learning, there is, in, 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 at least in while action learning, there is no session be, be um, not behind. Um, there is no session without an action plan. We do not finish a session without a clear plan of actions. So I ask, what will you do after the session? What will everybody in the team do after the session? Who will do what, when? How are we going to monitor the results? Next session, I will ask you what you have done until you know, that session. How will we know? How can we capture this plan so we can relate to it in the next session. Uh, action plan, always at the end of action learning, crucial. Number two, what did we aim to achieve? What was the goal for our meeting? What did we want 
here? And how did we do on that? And what are the conclusions from that? What are our learnings from, you know, the agenda, the plan for the meeting and the final result? Now, what helped us in this meeting? What did we do best? What were some obstacles in the meeting? What could we have done differently? I never ask, what did we do poorly? What did we do wrong? I never ask these questions. I don't want people to think that they're doing something wrong because that's not the point. The whole concept of right and wrong is not within my sort of framework of thinking. I always tell them, what can we do differently? What can we do better? It's kind of the same thing, but but they don't uh, comp- they don't start complaining about what they did poorly. Actually, what happens, people have such a strong tendency to talk about what went wrong in their mind that even if I ask, what do you think we can do better? Or what do you think we could have done better in the meeting? They will tell me what they think went wrong. Oh, because we focused on that and, and, and we, should have, we should have done that and, and we, we devoted too much time to this and that. And I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, can you say on the basis of that, on the basis of what you're saying right now, can you tell me what you think we can do better next time or what we could have done differently? Now, <clears throat> now, number six, I could ask, what have we learned about communication, cooperation, teamwork? Number seven, how can we work differently next time around? What skills did we see used in this meeting? Um, skill development is pretty important in while action learning. People give each other feedback at the end as far as you know, their, their skills were concerned. But this is the most general questions that I could use to draw people's attention to to the skills they used in the meeting. What skills did did you see used and who did it and what was the impact um, of those skills on our work? And I could use many other questions in that debrief. So this is number two. Again, no, uh, no, no feedback from my side, really. I don't give any, I sometimes give team the feedback, but not in this moment. This is not the moment for feedback. This is the moment for people to reflect and and tell me and tell each other about their conclusions that concern their work. Uh, Number three, what, so what, now what? One of the most useful models for coaching interventions. Um, Now, if I talk, when I, when I run the school uh, for co for action learning coaches, School of Action Learning here in Poland. We have this module. We talk about difficult situations with the group, difficult situations in the in coaches' work. And we often use this model to think about how the coach could react to different situations that can happen. So this is a really simple model, but the use of it really requires practice and, um, I guess, experience. At least that's what I observe in in new action learning coaches. They need time and practice to get used to this this tool, even though it's so simple. Three steps. What, in that what stage, I want to draw the group's attention to the way of their working, to the behavior that is happening in the group or the tendency. Now in the so what stage, I want to ask about impact of that behavior or that tendency. And in now what, I will ask about the next steps. So imagine, there is a lot of um, judgment. There's a lot of judgment in people's communication, right? So I could ask the question, now, how are we doing asking questions with curiosity? How are we doing with our openness to different ideas, to different thoughts, different perspectives? How are we doing on that? And people will tell me, Okay, we're doing okay. We're we're not doing okay. We're we're doing poorly with that. There is, you know, the level of openness is pretty low here. I say, okay, if it's low, now what is the impact of that on on our effectiveness? Well, it probably stops us stops us from seeing the entire perspective on the problem. It may stop us from developing some breakthrough solutions, some unconventional solutions. And I will say, okay, well, what can we do 
to mitigate that tendency? Well, how can we work differently <coughs> so that there is less of this behavior and more of curiosity, openness, um, inclusion of different ideas and opinions and so forth? When there is like intensive communication, people talk over each other, they shout. I will say, let's pause for a second. So how are we doing? What is the quality of our communication? What do you think is the quality? If you, you know, on a scale from one to 10, where are we? Oh, we are at four, maybe five at best. Well, what is the impact of that? Well, you know, we're not, you know, we're not sharing enough information and some people are dominating. Maybe some people are, are not participating. Well, what can we do to bring more equality in participation? What can we do to, to you know, bring the level of communication higher and so on. I'm giving you these, uh, this, uh, another example would be the one that is on the slide. I started thinking about different examples. There's one on the slide. What is the balance of participation? There is always, uh, well, not always, but there is frequently imbalance of participation at the beginning of the meeting. Some people are more extrovert. They, they think quickly. They talk a lot. Some people are more analytical. They, they, you know, they listen a lot. They don't talk too much. Well, what is the balance of participation? How does this influence our work, our effectiveness? I recently had a team tell me, well, there is imbalance in participation, but the effectiveness is high. It's okay for us right now. I said, okay, if it's okay for you guys, it's fine with me. I'm just checking. So no judgment, no assessment here. No, I sometimes give feedback, but I don't, but I don't, um, I don't, dis I don't sort of, um, I don't argue with the team. I'm not trying to tell them that I know better. I just ask them and then I say, okay, is there anything we can do to bring this to another level? Okay, that's how I use this tool. What, so what, now are really useful in difficult situations. Uh, but again, if you want to use it, make sure, make sure this is this sounds as natural as you can in a given moment this is the the most crucial part and it's basically as you can see it's it, it it's based on questions and step number one step number two step number three all of these are questions how are we doing with something what is the level of something in number one what is the impact in number two what are the next steps in number three okay number four Dale's Pyramid, something you guys know very well if you are coaches, like executive ICF coaches or something. Robert Dilt is a very prominent person in the world of NLP, I guess, and coaching, things like that. So this is his classic pyramid, I think. When I use this tool, I actually use like a, like a, like a 2.0 version. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if there's a 2.0 version. I just, I just add emotions there. I just add, um, what else do I add? Values. So basically the idea of this pyramid shows that certain areas can be changed quicker, uh, easier than others. The lower you are in the, in the pyramid, the easier the changes are usually, but also it shows that the higher you go in the pyramid, the larger the change will be if that area changes. So if you change your environment, is that going to change your skills, beliefs, or your identity? If you move to another town or you paint your room a different color, it might, right? It might influence that. I'm not saying no, but the change will be a lot larger to all of these areas if you change your identity or your beliefs. If you change your beliefs, you might start learning new skills. Your, behaviors, your behavior may change and you may start living in a different environment, right? Uh, seeing different people and so on. So this is, this is important when you work on an individual, an individual problem. If you work on organizational problems, it's, it, it may be useful too. It may be useful too, but it's especially useful when someone presents their individual challenge. And, and what often happens in teams 
especially like among specialists, engineers, sometimes managers, like low level managers, frontline, sorry, frontline managers. I shouldn't say low level, frontline managers. They will ask questions that are purely informative who, when, in what situations, how much, et cetera. And, and we sort of lack questions that are deeper, stronger, more powerful. So they ask questions about environment, behavior, and skills. And there are a few questions about what you think about it, why you think so, how do you know this is true? So what are your emotions around it? What do you think is what do you think causes these emotions, right? How would you feel if that happened, right? And then, and then, um, you know, identity or purpose. Why do you do it? Who who do you feel you are in this situation, right? Who do you feel the the other party is in this situation? Like, if you were to use a metaphor, how would you describe it? These questions play an important role. I'm not saying these are the, you know, the only questions we should ask, but I use this tool somehow, sometimes. I come to the flip chart. I quickly draw this, um, this pyramid or I have it prepared beforehand, before the session, and I ask questions like these. Now, dear team, my group, at which level do you think most of our questions land? So they look and they say, well... We ask mostly about the environment and his behavior. So what is the impact of this? Well, you know, we, we learn a lot. We, we analyze the situation. We seek the core of the problem. We exchange information. What are we gaining? Well, you know, we gain a lot of information about the whole situation. But what are we missing? Well, looking at this pyramid, we might be missing, you know, Maybe um, some information about he, how he feels about how he, how, what he thinks about his boss and his relationship and the whole system and stuff like that. So, dear team, what do you think? What other, what other levels would be useful to use in our discussion here? What are some examples of questions that could be asked in the next 20 minutes? Things like that. So I basically draw their attention it's like I actually use this model, use this uh, tool in combination with the what, uh, so what, now what model. So I will present the pyramid to the team and use the, the what, so what, and now what. I will say, where are we on this model? Like, where are, the, where are our questions? What is the impact of this? What are we gaining? What are we missing? Why is it important that we ask such questions? But what could we gain? What would, be, what would be the value of adding some other levels? And, and how, what levels do we want to add? What questions do we want to ask? And so on and so on. So ba- what I do in my coach's work is exactly the same what John Whitmore does in his coach's work. If you know John Whitmore, he's the author of Coaching for Performance. Um, in Polish, that would be Trening Efektywności. That would be in Polish. So John Whitmore is the guy that presented everybody with the GROW model, the most popular coaching model, I think, and so on. So he, in his book, if you read uh, Coaching for Performance, Whitmore underlines two things all over his book, raising awareness and, and like promoting accountability. Raising awareness, promoting accountability or, or responsibility. That's what I do with my teams. I say, take a look. Tell me what the impact is, which means broaden awareness, see more, and then take responsibility for your work. You decide how you want to work. Build pyramid. And the last one, CIA model. I think the simplest model, but pretty powerful because in team meetings, it happens that the team complains a lot about stuff that they have no influence over. No influence over because there is some, you know, large change in the corporation or, you know, the manage the, the top management, the board of directors has decided something and, you know, they can't change it, but they will discuss it. Okay. And then that turns into wishful thinking sometimes, right? Discussing things, expressing ideas that will probably never happen, but, but it would be great if we only had this or that. And if only that person acted in a different way, we would be in a totally different place. And we, right? That's how team meetings sometimes go. So when that happens, when I see, when I hear complaining, when I hear wishful thinking, 
I say, dear team, let's take a look at the simple model, right? It's called CIA. So, you know, we have these areas in life or at work that we have full control over. You know, when I'm making tea, I decide what tea I'm making. Similarly with coffee, if I go for beer, I decide who, who I'm going with. I can meet some people on the way, that's true, but it's my decision when I'm going, where I'm going, who I'm going with, right? I control it in a way. I may not have like 100% control because somebody may not join me, <laughs> but, you know, basically I decide what I do. And then there are some, there are some things that we have influence over, right? If you live in a partner, if you work in the team, you can offer something, propose something, you know, give feedback, ask that person, change his behavior or her behavior in a way that will be more suitable for you. So you have influence on that. But you don't have 100% control. And then there are areas in our lives, in our work that we have no control. We can only accept them. I'm not saying we should agree with them. It's a completely different story. We have to accept them because we can't change them. If, you know, it's rainy weather and I would like sunny weather, I don't have to agree that it's good that we have rainy weather. All I need to do is accept it because I can't change it. If I don't accept it, the only thing I will get is frustration and I will lose my time complaining or wishful thinking. So, dear team, if you think about our decision, where are we right now? How are we doing working on, on the scope that we control or we have influence over? Well, the team will tell me they usually notice that they, you know, sort of have gone off the track. And then I will say, well, what is the, the impact of that one? What is the consequence of continuing this uh, conversation, given the fact that we have 20 minutes left until the end of the meeting? Right? And they will tell me, and I say, okay, well, which, what do we really want to discuss in the next 20 minutes? Where do we want to move from this area accept to which area do we want to move? What do we want to talk about in, in, you know, in the rest of our meeting? This is how I use this model. And it's, again, in combination with the what, so what, and now what model. And, and it's all, again, about raising awareness and promoting responsibility. That's how I do it. Okay, if you stay until the end, I will give you this presentation if you want, but stay until the end. I still have some things to tell you. This is the end of the, the, of the content. We're, we're approaching the end. Um, tell me what you have learned in this webinar so far that you can apply in your work and your life in general. Let's reflect. I'll take 10, 20 seconds to think about one important thing you can take out of this webinar, this meeting, that you can implement in your work and in your life in general. And let me know down in the chat box. It will be very valuable for me to learn what you have learned in the meeting, all right? Sylvia, CIA, CIA method, okay. Katarzyna is right, typing something, let me know. Uh, make sure make, make sure you type your answers, even if your English is not perfect. The language doesn't matter. My English isn't perfect either. So just type in. Make sure it's kind of understandable. But but you don't don't worry about grammar or anything like that. The brief method. Okay. Intervene more frequently if needed. Absolutely. I love this thought. What is the question that anyone right now could ask to help us with the problem? Exactly. Awareness and responsibility. Yeah, that's not me. That's John Whitmore. <laughs> the brief, Dale's Pyramid and CIA. While in Polish, in English is a big difference. I'm, I'm curious about the difference, Piotrek. Um, yeah. Uh, SRWR method. Okay. Three models of group, group work. Yeah, you can, you, can, you can actually use these three models and, and show them to the team and discuss them with the team. That's useful too. More time for reflection. Ernie Turner would, would be proud. You can always find a solution. Definitely. And in the session, in an action learning session, we don't always find the solution, but we always identify some actions that can bring us closer to a solution. That's what beautiful, that's what is beautiful in action learning. In the session, don't look for solutions like, like the final solutions. Always seek actions 
that may bring you to the final solution. CIA, <laughs> Combo, okay. Tom, you, you got to make things done. From the previous meeting, Anna, I'm not sure what you mean. You got to make things done. I'm concerned. Okay. What's the what now what? Great tool to implement every year. Yeah, exactly. I agree. I love how much you guys are writing. Mostly Polish people. I can see there are some people from other parts of the world on my list, but they're not typing. Maybe they're shy of their English. This is the phrase that you present us that your coach always told you. Oh, you got to make things done. Oh, yeah, right. B. B Carson told me in relation to the group. Yeah, when I'm working with the group, make sure the group, you, you got you to gotta, you gotta, you gotta get the job done. Yeah, that's what she said. You have to get the job done. Yes. When I asked my, my, my mentor about you know, the relationship between learning and action, so she said learning is very important, but you have to get the job done have to deliver a solution. Okay, you guys are beautiful. Uh, so many reflections. Thanks so much. Uh, before we end, um, next webinar will be on October the 9th at 11 a.m. A change. We'll test that. We'll see how that goes. Uh, some people told me that 9 p.m. Is, is not too comfortable because you know they take care of the kids and it's a family time so we'll we'll see how this goes october the 9th i think it's wednesday 9 a.m cst so polish time 9, 9 uh, sorry uh 11 a.m october the 9th 11 uh, in the morning and it's going to be about how to prepare before a team coaching session i will notify about this via email it will probably be in polish We'll see about that. But it, I'm planning this in Polish. Um, so save the date, mark it in your calendars, and I will, I will let you know about, about the details in, in the email. Also, you guys asked me about the School of Action Learning in that we run in Poland. If you're not from Poland and you're interested in learning, action learning, and becoming a certified action learning coach that is certified by WILE, so you, you should go to wild.org, W-I-A-L.org, and then um, just, you know, just contact them through that website. And you can, you know, read about details. You can go to wildpoland.org to find about the certification in Poland. We still have places for the edition in autumn, which will be at the turn of October and November, and then the edition in December. Still have places in both. So if you if you want to know more about details or if you want to sign up, either go to wildpolar.org and then School of Action Learning, or just you know, just let me know directly via email. Uh, I will give you my contact information in a moment. And we have some time for uh for questions. Thanks, John. It's great that you were here. Uh, we still have some time for questions. Uh, let me know the questions in the chat box. And in the meantime, I will give you the link to the presentation. You can download it if you want. Make sure you, uh, you use it wisely, but you, can, but you can use it. I like to give you guys these resources because I believe we should all learn and we should all benefit from what we know. We're gonna die in a few years after all. I'm gonna die, well, not too soon, hopefully. Well, in like 50, 60, 70, 100 years, we'll all be dead. So why not learn from each other? Why not develop our skills as much as we can? Okay, here's the URL. Here's the presentation. Uh, click here. Okay. This will be visible for, for a few minutes. So somewhere on the top of your screen, you should see a green bar with... Um, with like click, uh, click, <laughs> click with a K. Sorry. Um, okay, I'm not going to correct it. It's a, it's a click with a K, but it's a, it's Polish typo. Anyway, let me know if you have some questions, and and remember, your English doesn't matter. I still have time for you. How do you choose the members of the group for your AL, AL sessions? Really good questions. I make sure the group is not too large, five, six, seven, seven people, as diverse as possible. So diverse competences, diverse um, 
backgrounds, ways of thinking, personalities. And also, if it's like an organizational problem, I talk with the sponsor of the problem, the problem owner. So I talk to the problem owner. I say, hey, you know, these are characteristics of a really good group. Now you tell me what will be your fellowship of the ring, metaphorically speaking. Who you think we should have in the team that will help you solve the problem in the past possible ways. But let's make sure it's not too big a team. It's it's diverse and 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 these people can you know can can work well together. If it's more like a, it's a, like a learning uh, platform, if I use action learning more for like development of managers or talent uh, development, I don't really talk to the problem owner because then uh, people usually you know they bring their individual problems. There is no like organizational or team problem, so I just make sure it's a diverse group, not too big. And I just the diversity is the key, and it's and it's good if people want to do it. They're not forced. Uh, it's, it, they're not nominated from the organization by the organization, but they really are motivated. How do you decide when to intervene and how often? Uh, great question. I really I really like this um, this question that I read in another good book about action learning. If you want another good book about action learning. Go to Amazon and you can buy uh, Skipton Leonard and Arthur Friedman, Great Solutions Through Action Learning. Great Solutions Through Action Learning. From that book, I found out the answer to your question, John. I, I, I read this question. What will be the difference if the team discusses this, this behavior? What will be the difference for them? Will this difference make a difference in their work, so to speak? <clears throat> so. I'm, I'm observing the team, and I, and I ask myself, what is more important, their discussion about the problem or their discussion about what is going on between them, the process, you know, the communication, participation, and so on. Sometimes there is a problem in, in communication or participation or like the atmosphere or whatever, but what is going on about the problem is really important, and I don't intervene. And another time, I will intervene because that, that process, the behavior, the tendency I see in the team is more important. So I will ask myself this question, what will be the difference for the team if I intervene? If it's a large difference, I will intervene. If it's a small difference, I can see a problem, but you know, it's not like it's not it's the discussion about the problem is more is more important. I'll save it for the end. I will ask the question I wanted to ask, but I will ask it at the end of the meeting. Um, Joanna, what do you mean by a problem owner, a person from a given organization responsible for that? Pretty much, yeah, that's a really, that's a good description of a problem owner. Actually, in action learning, we say problem, uh, problem sponsor, a thing in agile methodologies like Scrum, they talk about problem owners. Of course, you can work with team problems, department problems, organizational problems, individual problems. Doesn't matter, especially in the while methodology, because in like classic action learning, not so much, not so much. But in the while methodology, it's all about teamwork. So we can work, we can we can tackle any problem we want as long as it's complex and important for us. In Scrum, a product owner. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, because they have to develop a product, and here we have to solve a problem. Very similar. Okay, do you brief people about the specific of asking? Uh, absolutely. I, I, I almost never begin, ad hoc, uh, begin action learning sessions ad hoc, which means I always uh, prepare people for action learning. Uh, unless I'm doing a demo, like tomorrow I'm going to Warsaw to do a demonstration for one of the companies that are inviting me and then I will probably you know ask somebody to to uh, to, 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 to say about the, the problem that they have the issue but I always prepare people before and I do a quick workshop even one hour two hours three hour workshop on asking questions uh, the, you know the first ground rule I said statements questions types of questions, we train it a little bit. It doesn't help too much. If you prepare people before the session, it doesn't help. What it does is 
it lets you refer to it when you work with them. Okay. So they will probably work in a similar way. You know, the habits are too strong. But what it will do, it will allow you to say, remember in the preparation, we talked about these types of questions. Remember we did that exercise. How could how could we use this in our coaching session right now? This is the benefit of the preparation. Plus, it sets the environment, it sets the sort of the ground for them. They feel safe, they know what to do, they want, they know what to expect and what will be expected of them. These are the benefits of the preparation. But the quality of the teamwork is very similar, whether you do it without the preparation or with preparation. Okay, guys, it's seven minutes past 10, and it's high time we finish. I got to go to sleep. I have kids, and I have to drive them to the kindergarten tomorrow. Thanks so much for being with me tonight. Save the date for the next webinar. It's again um, October 9th, 11 in the morning. Let me know if you have any questions or, or issues related to our webinars, our meetings, School of Action Learning, whatever. And keep safe. Take good care. Thank you so much for being here. I really love that you guys are here and we can exchange some energy and um, have good night. Okay, as usual, I'll take a look if, if you guys are writing something that I should see. Thanks. Thanks to everyone. Good to hear you too, Radek. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Piotrek. <laughs> okay, go to sleep, Piotrek. Thanks, Anna. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Again, good night. I'm finishing the meeting. And make sure uh, you contact me. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me or call me if you have any questions, doubts, or anything that you will ask, you want to ask about. Okay. Thanks again. Have a good night. Bye-bye.